Alex, Brett. how are you? How are you, man? Good. How are you? I'm good, brother. Sorry about that. I just, just hang on. I need to put the phone on the charger because uh, the the navigation system uh, sucked all the energy out uh, while I was driving. Just a sec. Give me a sec, huh? No problem, man. <sighs> we um. Sorry, Brett. We stay at the same place, apparently. Yeah. Why? When? Uh, from March. What do you we, mean? We didn't. Move, we didn't move anywhere uh, <laughs> from March. <laughs> we didn't. You're right. From March until today, because of the pandemic situation. I don't yeah. know about in Australia or the United States, but in Russia, apparently, it's getting worse. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The numbers are numbers are rising very quickly. So you've been stuck in the in in the countryside in a terrible in, in countryside house in a terrible <laughs> countryside house. Are you in the sauna again? I am. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it better this way or the horizontal? Yeah, just like that. That's perfect. Okay. Um, listen, man, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Brett. Uh, I've got some light reflecting on the back. That's good, man. It's all good. Listen, there's so there's been so many people uh, asking for a pop off part two, man. I had to I had to come back, you know. So a lot of uh, a lot of respect out there for you, a lot of interest in you, um, a lot of love for you, man. So uh, it's it's incredible. We, you were episode fifty, which was just uh, poetic, and now you're going to be episode one hundred. So it's perfect timing, right? Well, always. Always, you know that in sprinting freestyle timing is uh, the key, key to success. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I want to talk to you about uh, your race strategy. Actually, I want to get inside Alex Popov's head for race strategy, but let's let's not talk about that right right now. Let, let's let's get into something um, that obviously you know I reached out to you because uh, of of a tragedy tragedy that happened in in your life, uh, the passing of your coach Gennady Turetsky on. Uh, August 7th, I believe, um, a very tragic event for you, obviously. How, wh where were you when you, when you heard the news? Who, who told you? Well, actually, I was, uh, I was here in, in Moscow at our house, and uh, my wife uh, brought this news to me because uh, Gennady's, uh, Gennady's wife, Ina, she called her. She called my wife, and uh, she, she said that Gennady passed away. And uh, yeah, well, it was a little bit of, well, not a little bit of a shock, but it was a shock. Because uh, you obviously knew Gennady quite well. Mm -hmm. You spent uh, a few uh, training camps with us. And mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Gennady, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to say. <clears throat> but when a man or a coach spends uh, between 30 and 40 hours with you a, a week, mm -hmm. it's... Uh, <clears throat> the relationship uh, becomes um, fairly close. Mm. He becomes uh, like a part of your life, big part of your life. And um, he's the one who is helping you to win apparently. Well, not apparently, obviously. And yeah. uh, and um, and uh, he's a big, I don't know, big part of your life, big part of your success, especially at the very beginning. And uh, oh, yeah, well, it's like, it's not, I wouldn't want to say that he becomes uh, uh, like a parent to you, but he definitely is like a, a mentor or um, he's not a coach. I don't like that word, a coach. He's, uh, he's, your, he's your mentor. He's your, I don't know, trainer. I don't know. What, how would you describe? What, what word would you find for, for the person uh, like Gennady? I mean, like uh, like anybody, like Gennady in in uh, in, in sportsmen's lives, yeah. And um, and uh, he he does become very important, and uh, he's he's like you know that shadow that follows you everywhere, basically. Mm. And yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it it was difficult. I mean, not not just for me, but I guess uh, for all uh, Gennady's swimmers that he used to coach and brought to success you know it was a big uh, big shock because you know he was quite young 71 you know mm. it's not that uh, that big of an age but and um yeah 
it uh, it was um, a bit difficult, a bit difficult to tolerate and uh, to cope and uh, to basically to to digest, uh, uh, let's say this this news. But life is life, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's it's difficult. Were were you able to get to his funeral at all? Unfortunately, not because of the pandemic situation. You know, the borders were not all widely open for us. Still not. Uh, even uh, still not at this moment, and uh, I could not uh, go to Switzerland. I could not, unfortunately. So were you able to, to have a conversation with his wife? Uh, we did speak with Ina and uh, a little bit uh, spoke to his daughter, Sasha. Mm. But um, no, no, but they obviously, can you imagine the state of, uh, let's say, uh, character you know that they were in you know very mm. shocked you know couldn't speak very well or couldn't speak much and then you know just left them uh, to cope uh, to to tolerate to go through this uh, process you know for a few mm. days and then yeah yeah you know for them for them it's obviously a lot more difficult because you know their, their lives depend on humanity and yeah. now they just have to uh, have to live with uh, what they have when was the last time you had a conversation with him? Funny enough, we we called him on his birthday. His birthday was on the 17th of July. Mm -hmm. He turned 71. And uh, we obviously spoke, uh, not a lot, but, you know, wished him all, all the best and, you know, stuff like that that you usually wish on uh, somebody's birthday. And uh, I didn't want to keep him on the line for very long because, you know, other phone calls and other uh, people wanted to, uh, obviously wanted to congratulate him. And then I think we spoke uh, once after that, but very briefly, just to find out how he was and how we were. And that was about all. Mm, wow. Was he in your life um since you retired you know was he was he a, a godfather to your children or was he anything you know how did you have a relationship with him after swimming we obviously we did not uh, see each other between 30 and 40 hours a week mm. but uh, our eldest son used to swim with Gennady used to be uh you know in his squad and in switzerland and he spent about three years there mm. And uh, after, after when uh, Swiss Swimming decided to, to shut down that swimming program, obviously, you know, he brought, uh, he, uh, he uh, came back home and uh, he went back to university and stuff like that. Yeah. But that was a big, uh, big shock for Gennady when that program was shut down, was closed completely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because Gennady, Gennady saw himself as a coach and he wanted to continue coaching uh, from, you know, even after that, but you know, there were not so many opportunities in Switzerland, unfortunately. Let's talk but, about his <clears throat> life as a coach with you a little bit. He, from what I understand, Gennady was an expert in many different areas of swimming, biomechanics, biochemistry, fluid mechanics, physiology, psychology. Uh, how did he relate these very complex concepts to you over time? Ah, well, you see, that's... Um... Let's say uh, one of the talents of an athlete is that uh, is the ability to convert, let's say, the word into movement. Mm -hmm. You know, when Gennady was trying to deliver, let's say, a message or deliver uh, an idea to you, and he, 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 he would tell you, he would describe it to you in words how he would do it and how he sees uh, this and this particular subject, well, not subject, but movement uh, mm. that you need to do. But it is up to you to realize the words and then bring it back to the water and into the movement. Mm. And this is uh, one of those abilities that, you know, I guess not just a swimmer, but any athlete should have. Because um, we are learning not by looking, but by, well, not learning, learning, but we're trying to improve the technique by working on those little bits and pieces huh, that uh, nobody, nobody speaks about or nobody thought of uh, before. 
And it is up to you, you know, to realize what has been said and bring it back into the movement, like into the motion, into the water. And, uh, and this is uh, no, not easy, not easy, because you really have to have a really good coordination. You really have to have good knowledge of your body like all the muscles that are involved in this particular movement because you know yeah you've done that you know why why do you ask yeah i mean i, I mean he was a very intelligent man but i under, from from what i know from him is that um he had a certain way that he wanted you to swim and and what i'm trying to get at is what is the Alex Popoff way of swimming? Uh, why was it so successful for you? Why did you connect with it? What, how did you change sprinting? Because you changed sprinting. You, you changed the way people swam. You changed the way I swam. I didn't swim. I wasn't a good swimmer before I met Gennady Turetsky, before I met Alex Popoff. I was just uh, somebody that moved their arms and legs. Uh, Gennady helped me understand why I was doing things and and held me accountable to those things more so than anybody else early on in my career. And by the time I met you, you were doing these things so well that uh, it was it was painful for me because I, I'm like I can't keep up with this man. He's too good. He's 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 like everything he does is on point, you know. So for for you, what what were the concepts that he was getting across to you that you were working on every day? Um. Okay, let's say uh, that uh, first of all, it was the quality. Yep. Quality of each training, uh, each workout. Yep. Because, um, and you know, you learn, you learn with the years, with the experience of, I mean, with the years of experience, with the years of training, you learn uh, things hard way. You know, you, if you can't do it properly from the first time, the coach or whoever asks you to repeat it and repeat it and do it once more and more and more until you do it correctly so i've done uh, this couple of well these things uh, when i was younger so i've learned to do everything from the very first time what you was know? he trying what was he what was some of the things he wanted you to do over and over again give me a concept of something that he wanted you to repeat well let's say uh stroke rate under 30 for each lap in training, no matter how how uh, tired you are, mm -hmm. stroke rate under 30, you know, and uh, my worst one would be, well, not if we're, if we're not uh, going full speed, of course, you know, from push, but um, let's say at the end of five kilometer swim, like time swim, you know, I would do like maybe 28 strokes and, you know, that would be considered as I was very tired and uh, the stroke length uh, was uh, very short. Uh, usually my stroke rate was about 24, 25 per lap, no matter how far, in, you know, I went into the distance, be it, be it 50, be it 100, be it 400, be it 1500. Usually my stroke rate would be about 24, 25 per lap. Mm -hmm. And this is, this, is the, this is the main idea that I was working on, quality, quality and efficiency. And uh, second maybe thing is that uh, I've learned how to accelerate not by increasing the stroke rate, by increasing the, the efficiency, like this, the power. Wow. And, and as a coach, how would he hold you accountable to this? What are, what are some of the things he would say to you? No, nothing. Basically, you know, we came, uh, well, not, uh, we came to a stage when we basically visually uh, understood what, uh, uh, what uh, Gennady meant, you know, we would be going like uh, a distance, like swimming something, and Gennady would look at us, you know, because he was uh, that type of person or that type of coach that uh, would not interfere with you very, very much dur during training. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't stop you during uh, your, your workout and uh, tell you that you don't do this and this correctly. He would just point you while you're swimming what to look at and what to point your attention at. So basically every time you have to have your eyes on him. Mm. And um, yeah, we've learned that, you know, whatever he was showing that it's, uh, well, first of all, I did understand that there was, uh, it was for me, not for Michael, or not for Matt, or not for you, or not for somebody else. And uh, secondly, I we've learned, you know, those uh, movements that, uh, you know, that uh, what we need to pay attention at, be it the uh, end of the stroke, be it the beginning of the stroke, be it recovery, 
And uh, this was uh, basically our language of uh, communication during uh, training sessions. I mean, we all have influences. Do you know who Gennady's influence was? I see a name, uh, Alexei Krasikov. Was, was he an influence on Gennady? It was big influence. Uh, Alexei Krasikov, he was uh, Gennady's personal coach. And I was uh, fortunate uh, before, before I joined Gennady's squad, I spent a couple of training camps with uh, Alexei Krasikov. Mm -hmm. I was coached by him back in 1990 a couple of times. And um, first, uh, it was, I think, in July, and second was in September. Very, very bright uh, man. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. About 10 years ago, he passed away. But uh, in terms of technique, I think he was really the best coach that I've known. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so yeah. Gennady was influenced by him and brought a lot of his theories and philosophies into what he was doing with you. Exactly. Exactly, yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Okay. And they, they were always uh, in touch, they were always communicating, discussing uh, the new ways, the new ideas. And yeah, when, when Alexei was alive, you know, Gennady was uh, on the phone call, well, on the phone with him quite on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, they were discussing a lot of, uh, a lot of new ideas and a lot of, a lot of initiatives that Alexei uh, could not, uh, did not, or was not able to bring into the action uh, due to his retirement and age and stuff. And, uh, but, you know, they were, they were you know, good friends, I would say. Mm. What was your personal relationship like with Gennady outside of the pool? Obviously, when you're in the pool, you're very respectful and you, you trusted him. Was there a relationship you had outside the pool? More like our normal friends, you know, like we would uh, celebrate, uh, let's say, not Christmas, but New Year's, you know, because uh, New Year's celebration is big in Russia, mm -hmm. not in Australia, unfortunately. We would celebrate, be it Christmas in Australia and New Year's or just New Year's in, in back in Europe somewhere. Uh, yeah, every time uh, we, would, uh, we would be in Switzerland, we definitely would go for dinner or he would come to our place and, you know, spend an evening or a few evenings with us and then talking and, you know, sharing the views and discussing little bits and pieces. And yeah, like, like uh, friends that have not seen each other for quite some time, you know? Yeah. Very so, happy. We were well, very happy to see each other. Yeah, yeah. What about if there was a, a struggle in your life, a challenge in your life, or something you were dealing with? Were you able to take that to Gennady and talk to him personally about your own personal struggles? Not really. Not really. Well, Gennady was always, um, he was that type of coach or person that would give you a choice. He definitely was uh, a little, not a little, a lot more uh, wiser than us, let's say, because of, the, because of his age and uh, knowledge. And he would uh, give me, first of all, his own point of view, how he would do things. And then he would give me a few ideas to choose from. And then uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, we would discuss uh, everything with him and then find the common, common way, you know, that we like both. And then we just follow the path. Uh, back in 1996, when I, uh, was, uh, when I came to Australia from... From, you know for recovery and uh, he told me that you know we've got a long way because I was about 10 kilos under under my normal uh, racing weight uh, weight and uh, and uh, you know that took me nine months to recover just to put the weight back on and uh, Gennady was very passionate you know one week training one week off two weeks training two weeks off three weeks one week off and then slowly, 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 he brought me in. Brought me into full speed and, you know, full training uh, mode and progress and then, you know, load and you name it. Yeah. How do you want the swimming world to remember Gennady? What do you want them to remember of Gennady? How do, how do you want them to celebrate his life? Well, that's quite difficult, huh? It's not easy. Um, but... Right, you know, you know what to ask, huh? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he was I, a revolutionary, I right? I mean, he he changed. Obviously, he changed the way we we sprint. He changed the way we think about sprinting 
I, I believe, right? He, he has done a lot of uh, that type of work, change in the way people and athletes and coaches uh, think in Australia. Yeah. He has done a lot of that. You know, he, 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 he was, uh, that was a big effort, let's say, big effort from Gennady. I remember when we just came to Australia, you know, we would go to, let's say, to swimming clinics and Gennady would be talking to coaches for hours and uh, convincing them. And then, you know, uh, training camps, Australian national team training camps, you know, they would travel to, you know, be in Hawaii or be somewhere else. And all coaches, all swimmers would be swimming, uh, uh, following Gennady's uh, program. And then, you know, he, he managed to get everybody together and uh, um, pointed everybody to the same direction. Not against each other like local you know war but big big strategy you know where we are looking beyond horizon and you know going there how did you feel about that how how did you feel about that as as olympic champion as as a foreigner coming into a foreign land him sharing opening up his program to to these these other people did that make you feel a certain way no no i was very well i was very fortunate and i was very happy to be part of that program because uh Australia gave me an opportunity to continue to keep on swimming, to continue my career. And uh, when I came to Australia, you're right, uh, it was uh, everything was new for me. You know, new society, new language, new culture. Everything was new. And uh, funny enough, but this is such a huge motivation, you know, to keep on going, to keep on pushing. And uh, this is what uh, kept me going uh, for, well, uh, for, for, the last, for the next... Uh, let's say seven to 10 years. Yeah. But like in terms of Gennady and his knowledge and his, he's molded you and he's shaped you and he's, he's given you these great strategies. And then all of a sudden he's opening up those things to everybody else. Did you not feel threatened? Like, no. you know, at all? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brett, no, no, not threatened because, you know, uh, well, the way I swam back in 1992 was very different. The way I swam in 94 and beyond. And because uh, not only Gennady was improving himself and I was also improving myself because this is uh, like a constant process, you know, be it, uh, be it mentally, be it physically, be it uh, psychologically. And uh, yeah, we, we were all working, uh, you know, going further and further up. And, um, you know, not, not just Gennady was developing, but everybody else around him. You know, when Klimi yeah. started to swim with us, you know, um, he was, uh, well, how old was he? he was about 16 or so. And, um, you yeah, know, Klimi developed his own way. He, he went his own way. I kept going my own way. And Matt Dunn was going his own way. And uh, we had uh, many swimmers in our squad. And uh, you were there too. And Dwight Sheehan. And, you know, mm -hmm. well, we had a lot of people. And we all kept on going our own ways, our own techniques and, you know, our own strategies. And, uh, you know, and I, I kept going my own way. Have you had a chance to talk to any of your former teammates, like the people that you mentioned since Gennady's passing? Um, Danny. Uh, Matt Dunn. Yeah. With, uh, yeah, Matt Dunn. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, Matt uh, spoke with Ian Thorpe. Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't speak to Michael. I don't have his number. But I'll, um, I'll send it to you after this. All right. Okay. No problems. Fantastic. I'll give him a call. And uh, um, his former swimmers in Russia. Yeah, we did speak to each other. His uh, first uh, junior USSR swimming champion. We also speak uh, on a regular basis. Gennady's former swimmer. And um, other guys that we used to train with before 92 games, uh, you know, we were, we all have a chat, you know, in, in WhatsApp. Yeah. And um, when I heard uh, the news about Gennady, I immediately wrote that in the chat. And man, you know, there was, there was big wave, like straight away. Do you feel a need to visit the gravesite? Do you feel like you need to go and, and say something to him at all? Um, well, Gennady has been cremated. His ashes are not uh, buried yet because Ina, his wife, uh, 
she thinks, oh, she's uh, thinking of uh, going back to Australia and taking Nationals of United to Australia. Mm. Okay. Oh, one day yeah. we'll, we'll, it, well, that will be a good, uh, good uh, opportunity, let's say, for us to come and visit Australia. Yeah, absolutely. If, if she does that. Let me ask you a tough question. If you had one more chance to have one thing to say to Gennady, what, what do you think you would say to him if you had one more chance? Probably thank him once again for everything that he's done for me. I mean, for me and helped me to, to become what I am or who I am. Beautiful, yeah. I'm sure he would appreciate that, but I'm I'm also sure he knows that. So there's no doubt in my mind he, he knows that. When I think of Popov, I think of Gennady. When I think of Gennady, I think of Popov. You know, I, I see you guys as together always. There's no separation in the two of you when I think of, of either one of you. You know, I, I think of you as a partnership for sure. So tell me this. Uh, let us into Popov a little bit. Talk to me about your your strategy of... How do you swim? How did you swim your hundred freestyle? What was your strategy? What was going on inside Popov's head uh, right before the blocks when when you wanted to execute something or you had trained to execute a hundred freestyle? What was the perfect hundred freestyle for you? Okay, um, the very the very um, uh, first uh, words that Gennady told me about hundred freestyle. He said, Alex. A key success to 100 freestyle is second, 20, a second 50 under 25. First, we need to learn how to swim second 50 under 25. And in particular, last 25 of, seven, of 100 meter freestyle. This is uh, where it starts to really, you know, pay back. I heard all there. And uh, we have been working on that. We have been working on that from day one, from then day one when I joined his squad. When I started to swim, when I started to pull those uh, 50s under 20, second 50s under 25 in training, we would uh, on a regular basis, like maybe once or twice a week, we would do a drill, five second negative split, 30, 25 for the 100 from push, no start, no nothing, from push, 30, 25. And when I started to go regularly under 25, like uh, 24, 7, 24, 5, 24, 8, then he said, okay, now, uh, now you've learned your feelings on the second 50. Now you need to learn your feelings on the first 50. The, the, the ability to swim the, 50, the second 50 under 25 will give you an opportunity or a chance to win under any circumstances, under any situation, no matter what you do in the first 50. And later on, that proved to be the right direction and right strategy because no matter how hard they went the first 50, and the, 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 you know, the guys, the opponents would be looking at me and uh, not realizing that I would either hold them back and then just accelerate uh, off, the, off the turn and then, you know, make the, the gap and then just keep, keep it until the, the, the end. Or I could uh, go a little bit faster, but with that ability to go under 25, the second 50, I was uh, able to maintain higher speed on the second lap. So for me, the strategy was quite, quite open. Uh, I had a big variety, but, uh, Speaking about that, you know, we all, oh, well, no, we modeled all those strategies in training with the fast first 50 and then maintaining the speed with the slow first 50 and, and accelerate in the second 50 and second half of 100. So we, we worked all those strategies in training and I had a big variety. I had like, I always had a joker in my uh pocket you know that mm -hmm. i could pull out and you know use uh, during uh, during tra uh, during uh, competition and uh, <clears throat> i had uh, obviously i was uh, very well prepared for 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 the strategies that i could use you know fast slow slow fast moderate moderate you know well, I, ideally what did you want to flip in the first 50 what what how did you want it to feel what did you want to get out in uh, 
Usually, usually we were calculating, uh, calculating very simple. You know, the difference between the first and the second 50 should be around one and a half to 1.6 seconds. Mm. And if you want to swim your second 50, let's say 24, five, though, you, 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 you should go out in 22, nine. There is no need to go, let's say, 22.5 and then coming back in 25.5 because, uh, you know, that would be maybe a bit too much on, this, on the first 50 and th then you will not be able to bring it back. So the calculation was very simple. One and a half to 1.6 seconds, uh, the difference between the first and the second 50. This is the ideal way of, uh, let's say, swimming the 100 freestyle. So if you start 23 flat, 24 5 uh, it is your time coming back home nice i love that there's one thing that always confused me about you alex you were big on um fluid mechanics you were big on streamlining you were big on flow you're big on um ease of of stroke everything you i mean you just did things perfectly but what i couldn't understand about you is why didn't you wear a swim cap <laughs> I don't like rubber. <laughs> oh, that one got me by surprise. <laughs> That's good. No, no, everybody thinks that I was I was either bald or I was wearing the same cap. I said no, no. Mm, you don't. Well, on a few occasions, you know, when we were in Italy and uh, somewhere else. There was an obligation to wear a swim cap for for um, for a training, and I could not wear it. I, you know, my whole session was ruined. I spent the whole time, you know, putting it on, uh, you know, taking it off and putting it back on. You know, I just don't like that feeling of uh, wearing the swim cap. Did you never think that it was slowing you down, though? Did you, you know, with the, with the streamlining effects and and all these things? No. Did you not think it was slowing you down? No, you don't keep your head under, you know, under water that that deep. True. True true <laughs> all right well then talk to me about the the 50 strategy because it's something that i could i, I only could really swim the 50 i didn't have the uh the, the second 50 like you did but but talk to me about your 50 strategy because i think there are certain things that you can do that are mistakes in the 50 i mean certainly like trying too hard pulling the water too hard over spinning over rating uh, are mistakes that you can make <clears throat> what was the pop-off strategy for a fast 50 um the you know there are if you let's say um, break the 50 into a few segments you know the first segment would be about start what about 15 meters mm -hmm. the ideally 15 meters underwater and then after that when you're surfacing you know the first really three maybe four strokes should not be very tough you know not as as you mentioned not to break the water so you know you don't you don't break that feeling of uh, of water mm -hmm. you know on your hands and then after that, basically, that speed between 50 and the 25, this is very, very important because, you know, this is, the, the, this is your ability to pick up the speed from the start and bring it, you know, into the motion, you know. Um, it's, um, kinetic, is, uh, I'm keep, you know, keep forgetting Australian words, but, <clears throat> you know, the one, one type of energy you have to convert into another one, you know, into kinetic energy though, so that it brings you, really brings you, takes you forward. And, um, and uh, what else? You know, and then the second, uh, and then the second uh, uh, portion of that 50 would be between 25 and 35 meters. This is the key uh element of the distance you know if you drop that speed you know there forget about the finish you lost so in training it's extremely important to to uh learn to train that that distance you know that 10 meter uh you know gap not the gap the the the, the lap uh so that you you you'll be able to maintain let's hope to maintain the speed you know not drop too much because you know speed speed drops are uh, quite dramatically towards the end of the 50 from from the start mm -hmm. so if you learn not to drop that speed you know at that distance you know during those 10 meters then you're quite sweet you know when you enter in the last 15 meters which is your finishing uh, finishing strike did you have a strategy to to not breathe or were you were you always trying to work a breath in i 
you know, my uh, strategy was to take one at about 33 to 35 meters because I've, I've tried a few things and, you know, it's not worth it, really. I found out that it's not worth uh, to uh, take it uh, all the way without breathing. Yeah, yeah. We, we raced each other uh, next to each other at the Sydney Olympics in the semifinal. When I was ahead of you at the 35-meter mark, what, what did you think? Nothing. You know, I, knew, <laughs> I, knew, I knew what I had to do. You know, when, when you're racing in the Olympics, uh, uh, you always have to think of your own way, of your own distance. And uh, what happened between 35 and 50 meters? <laughs> you destroyed me. You destroyed me. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said, you know, you've dropped that speed and I just maintained it. <laughs> you did. You did. And I was thinking, oh, my God, Popov's coming. Popov's coming. I'm dead. I'm dead. You're in my head, man. You got me. There's no doubt about it. Um, I, I Listen. I used to love competing against you, man. I really did. I just want you to know that personally. I don't care about who's listening out there. I loved competing against you. You were, you were the best of the best. You still are the best of the best. Uh, everybody I talk to says, uh, who's, who's the greatest sprint of all time? There's no doubt it's Popoff, you know? So um, you are a pleasure for me. Even every time you beat me, it was still a pleasure, you know? Thanks, Brett. Huh? No, uh, we always have fun, huh? We always yeah. had fun when we competed, you know, be it in Australia or elsewhere, like World Cup or Mara Nostrum or World Championships, or you name it. We did. I, and I appreciated that about you. You did make it fun. And it, it wasn't uh, life and death for you necessarily, but you always came out on top. But, you know, you made it fun and I enjoyed that. Uh, you, you always had a smile. You always uh, congratulated you know, at the end of the races, um, it was just a pleasure. It was just a pleasure, honestly. Um, let me ask a couple of other questions that are of interest to people. And, I, and I'm sorry if this is a little bit personal, but there's rumors out there about you that you did smoke cigarettes. Is this true? I mean, you know, there are so many other rumors about me, yeah? <laughs> I, about Russians in particular, you know, that we, we, we live on vodka and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. That's uh, true. It's uh, just rumors, you know, that might, don't collect gossips. <laughs> All right, we'll pull that, we'll kill that one. I appreciate that. What about this? Why didn't you choose, why did you choose not to wear um, these new suits that came out in, in Sydney? You, you, you stuck with the brief. Why did you make that decision? Uh, well, I still think that swimming is uh, physical, but not, you know, technical swimming. Huh? Yeah, no, I consider swimsuit as a technical support. And uh, because at that stage, uh, the technology was not developing as fast, but I could see where it was going. It was not really my protest, but, you know, I, no, I didn't like swimsuits. Still don't. A uh, few years down the track, uh, I'll tell you a little story. A few years down, well, after that, you know, back in 2009, we had the big meeting at FINA regarding the, those swimsuits. And by that time, FINA had already hired a, a hydrodynamic professor from the University of Lausanne, I believe, uh, to find out the testing procedure for the swimsuit, you know, the permeability, flotation, so on and so forth. And... Uh, Believe it or not, he could not find, he could not come up with any clue, with any clear ideas how to test the, the, the swimsuit. And, uh, and then back in, well, back then, back in 2009, at the big meeting and said, listen, you know, I was talking to one of the uh, directors of uh, FINA and I said, listen, you've lost the track, you've lost the control of the technological development of the material. Mm. You know, you have to forbid it because, you know, you're ruining sport. We had a huge argument then, huge argument. And now I think, you know, I was like a kind of persona non grata, you know, at FINA for, for some time. But after that, you know, the next year they forbid it. They, you know, they said mm -hmm. no more swimsuits. Yeah. And this is, this is, uh, uh, this is what I saw back in 2000. And that's why, you know, I kind of refused to wear the swim, full swimsuit. Do you, do you still follow swimming these days? Do you, I mean, do you still watch it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, oh. you know, like if I cannot physically 
definitely be at the competitions. I certainly watch it on the television or internet or wherever. Is there anyone that you admire now? Is there anybody that you think is, is sprinting well? Is there anybody that you, you see similarities in or you just enjoy watching right now? Who do, who do you think are the, the top sprinters right now? Um, let's say about the 100. Let's speak about the 100. 50 for me is uh, not as important as the 100. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, there are two big, uh, big uh, shows these days, Kyle and uh, Kyle Lipa. You know, the Australian yeah. Kyle, 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 Kyle Chalmers. Uh, Chalmers, yeah, and uh, Kylie Dressel, obviously, you know, they are the ones that who will be pushing each other, you know, for the top uh, spot on the podium. Mm -hmm. uh, they are both very interesting to watch because both of them have the ability to swim the second 50 under 25, well under 25, mm -hmm. 24, 5 and, and, uh, and lower. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is just the ability of, uh, of them to go on to go fast uh, the first 50 and uh, it's going to be an interesting really interesting race nobody else will be able to keep up with them actually the you and i believe the same things I, I think the same thing i think those two have separated themselves from the field they're they're incredible um with their skills uh, i think their mental capacities as well i think they've really created some separation i think it's a race between two guys yeah definitely yeah. That yeah. will be an interesting race uh, in Tokyo if uh, the games will take place. Why do you think that, I mean, swimming obviously always progresses, you know, I'm sure there are people when you were doing your swims and your times 20 years before that would have thought, how is Alex Popoff swimming so fast now? We see what they're doing now. But how do you think they're swimming so fast? Why has swimming improved so much? I think um, my personal opinion would be that, you know, they uh, work in the gym has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. You know, athletes became so more physical, you know, like bigger, more athletic than what we used to look like. Even mm -hmm. though, well, stop cracking your neck like that, sorry, will you? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you caught me. <laughs> um, Oh, back then, when we used to train, you know, we, we, we definitely, we did a lot of uh, dry land, like every day, let's say one hour, one hour and a quarter. Mm -hmm. But we did not come up with, uh, even close to what, uh, you know, guys are doing these days. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, one of the big, big uh, changes in, in sprinting freestyle, a dry land. Mm -hmm. A dry land that has changed into a separate proper training session. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I also think recovery in a way has, has evolved and changed, which is, which is helping them, you know, produce more quality in, in practice. So I think both those areas absolutely are, are correct. Um, I also think that once you see somebody do something, then the belief starts to change as well. It starts to shift, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Know, and also, you know, the, the times are improving. So you have to mentally have to get ready for, for, you know, for big, uh, bigger challenges and higher speeds and faster swims and, you know, more pain than, uh, than us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, where are we at right now with the Russian Federation in terms of, um, I, I know that there was a time where I felt like they were banned from, from 2020, uh, have they been reinstated now? Are they able to swim under the Russian flag now? <clears throat> um, in terms of swimming, yes. In terms of athletics, no. Truck and field. Um, there, there, there will be some cast hearings, I believe, starting from you know, starting in November. Regarding you know all those uh, decisions and situation developments uh, for the future, but for now, I think you know we're we're okay. We're okay. We we've got our flag and we've got our national anthem and everything. The, you know the attributes for the games, but the decision will will be made uh, will be made a little bit uh, later down the track. Okay. What about our Russian sprinters? Who's the best Russian sprinter right now? We've got one guy for the 100. He's um, 47, 5 ish, 5, 6, 4, 5, 6. Um, Who's that? Grinov. His name is Vlad Grinov. Uh -huh, okay. I think he will be interesting to watch. He's about 20, 
four, mm -hmm. 24, 23, 25, somewhere in that bracket. Okay. I think he's 24, might be 25. Is he training sure. in Russia as well? He's training in Moscow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. he started quite late. He started uh, at about uh, 22, 23. You know, he he evolved uh, about what one and a half, maybe two years ago from the from from the field. And uh, no, he's uh, he's quite efficient. He's um, he uh, swims 200. He's more two and 100 uh, freestyler than 150. And uh, his, uh, you know, his ability to swim 200 really helps him on the 100. Um, what about Vlad Morozov? He's been around for a while. He's, he's, he's close. Like, how do we get him over the edge? How do we make him Olympic champion? He missed his timing. Too old now? Well, not too old, but he's, uh, uh, you know, he should have done it about, yeah, about 10 years ago five years ago, six years ago, eight years ago. You know, the time, you know, the, you, you should you should do it when your time's, you know, is uh, is uh, up. You know, you can't postpone it for four years and try to repeat it and then maybe uh, for another four years after that. No, if you, if you can do it, you do it now. If you can't do it, you don't. That's one of those you messages that Gennady had for you, right? The, when you were at that age, you, Gennady told you, it's, it's your time now, don't wait four years, right? Exactly. Well, it's not. It was not him. It was Mark Spitz who, uh, who said it to me. You know, it's uh, it's better to become an Olympic champion at twenty and not at twenty-four. <laughs> we true. we were in in Italy at the competitions, and uh, there happened to be twentieth uh, anniversary of uh, that meeting, the swim swim meet, and it was my twentieth birthday as well. And uh, he said, you know, it's better to become an Olympic champion at twenty and not at 24 it's quite clear oh that's true well, well i'm glad you listened to him at the time i mean i'm sure people told me some things too but i never really listened <laughs> <laughs> um what about this tell me like you know sometimes you come across as superhuman you know when i was in taper and and certain periods of time i had doubts and fears you know when you go through taper you start to question things you start to question yourself did Alex Popov go through the tape of blues where you felt terrible some days or you just didn't have it? Like, was there anything like that for you? No, no. <laughs> uh, at the, you know, when I started to swim with Gennady, uh, he was uh, obviously uh, the one who convinced us, you know, from the very beginning that, you know, everything that we do, I know how to do it and I know how we should do it and uh, we will do it. And he was uh, able uh, to find the right word uh, if we needed that for every day, you know, to, just to keep us motivated. And so we would not have any doubts that we absolutely do everything correctly. And then after that, you know, once you learn, once you learn first time, you start to do the second, third and fourth and you develop your own skills. And, uh, you know, usually why do you have doubts? Because you, you have not done enough in training, you know. If you have done, if you have tried it in training, man, you never have any doubts. You never have any doubts. The only thing you're waiting for is the competition to come. Was that hard for you to sit and wait? Or was it, what, what did you do when you had to sit and wait? Um, this is, uh, this is uh, the tricky part, you know, because, you know, you obviously spend less, less time in the pool, in the mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have more time, you know, outside the pool. And this is very important what you do outside the pool. You know, you can, you, you have to get your head occupied and busy. You know, you can start reading books or start do some other things, but you have to occupy your uh, brain. Otherwise, you know, athletes and uh, I know a few examples, athletes do go crazy. Mm -hmm. They cannot, they, they start eating like crazy and put weight on and uh, yeah, yeah. I have never heard much about your family life or your, your, your mother and father. What type of impact did they have on your life? Well, my parents were always supportive of uh, what I was doing from the very young age. It was my father's decision. He basically insisted that I would uh, be taken into a swimming pool and learn how to swim because I didn't obviously know how to swim. 
and my my mom took me to the pool and uh, so this is how I ended up in the, in the war and uh, sometimes you know journalists or people ask me why did you choose swimming my, my simple answer is you know all other sports you know that uh, we had an opportunity to choose from in my hometown they were basically um, linked to running and I absolutely hate running. I, this is the best, the, I mean, the, the worst punishment for me, running. <laughs> from the very first, from the very first time when I had to run in training, man, you know, I, I hated it. Mm. Be it cross country skiing, be it athletics, be it just normal running, you know, cross country running, trucks and, you know, <laughs> man, you know, I would, uh, I would, swim five ten kilometers you know instead you know i would, would be more pleased to, than you know to go for a 10 kilometer run yeah so would your parents come to the meet so like, did they attend the olympic games no never. never never they only watched it on the television uh and they 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 came to a world shot course in moscow remember 2099 yeah. mm -hmm. when was that 2001 yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, somewhere yeah, there. maybe 2000. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, they, they came to that meet and uh, that's it. Yeah, wow, all the other times, you know, no, didn't come anywhere. Did they, what kind of parents were they? I mean, who, who cared more? Did, did somebody, did they hold you accountable in any way, or was it like, Alex, you go do what you want to do, and we're going to be, what kind of parents were they? In terms of athletic, oh, well, no, no, no. You know, there were. You know, you always have uh, that um, connection to your parents that are always behind you, supporting you, no matter what, what, how old you are, and where you are, and what you are. And uh, I always uh, call them. You know, be the be it on the training camp or at the competition somewhere. I would always call them and then say a few words. You know, and then I called them after Barcelona games. I went to the um, I don't remember be it post office in the village or something. I brought that. Uh, I bought that uh, po uh, the card that I could uh, use on the public phone to, mm -hmm. you know, call another country. Mm. Man, they were so surprised, you know, because I, I come from a very small town, and we didn't have a direct uh, international connection. So I had to go through the communicator, you know, call, com, you know, I had to call the Russian uh, telecommunications, and then they had to connect me to that town. And then, you know, and then I would uh, tell them, you know, then there would be another person and I would tell them the telephone number and they would connect. <laughs> and uh, my mom picked up the phone and she was like, whoa, where are you calling from? I said, mom, I'm from Barcelona. <laughs> Call me, you know, we just you know, exchanged a few words of congratulations and so on and so forth. But then I ran out of money <laughs> <laughs> on the card. <laughs> oh, classic. I love it. Where are your gold medals? Where is your where's your Olympic gold medals? Are they in Moscow? They're with me. Oh, okay. So you have, you have them all yeah. with you. Yeah, but not in, in my in, in my house. They are elsewhere. Oh, okay. In a safe, somewhere safe. That's good. Yeah, some in a safe place, yeah. Is there an Alex Popov statue somewhere? No. No? No, no statue? No, don't deserve it. Oh, you absolutely deserve it. It needs to be somewhere <laughs> for sure. No, 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 no. No, there is none. There is none. Well, we need to we need to make a push on this somewhere. We need some we need some statues somewhere uh, for sure. Um, are you going to be attending the Tokyo Olympics? Well, as a member of the IOC, I should be there. Yeah, I hope that they will take place. Yeah, I do too. What's because your prediction right now? Brad, uh, it's going to be difficult. Really difficult, you know, numbers are rising, you know, the pandemic situation is not very healthy at the moment. Even though we have vaccine, you know, it's not very clear, not very clear. Yeah. People in Russia are starting to get a uh, sick second time, sick or even, uh, second or even third time. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. yeah. It's going around now and uh, the second time is uh, tougher than the first time. Oh, wow. Jeez. Yeah. So from an IOC perspective, it doesn't look good, hey? Well, it looks uh, very shaky, I would say. Very shaky at the moment, but, you know, 
President Thomas Bach and John Coates as the, the chairman of Qualcomm. He's convincing that, you know, the games will go ahead and uh, everything is under control and so on and so forth. But hey, the reality is slightly different. Huh? In your opinion, if they cancel 21, does that mean Tokyo is completely gone or do they go to 22? No, 22 is uh, winter games in Beijing. So once 21 goes, it's over. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There will be no more Tokyo. Well, it might be Tokyo 32 or 36 or something, but no, no, definitely not 21 and 22. Wow, that's shocking, huh? Shocking. It is, yeah, it is a very, very difficult situation. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Well, listen, I've asked a lot of questions. You've opened up again uh, a lot. This has been uh, incredible for me, man. I, I love you so much uh, for sharing. And, and my, my, there's a lot of, lot of people around the world that love to hear from Alex Popoff. Trust me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Brett. Yeah. Always a pleasure speaking to you. But let's say, let's, let's say there will be no more 150. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's it we'll run out no more 200 there's not 200 that's for sure <laughs> yeah it's too far for us listen man stay healthy all right and uh, i'll pass uh, i'll forward uh, michael klim's uh, number to you all right yes please yeah Great. Right. thanks champion take care champ. Ciao, ciao. bye